going live. Hey y'all, I am James Wright and welcome to my shop. And tonight we are going to be doing a live Q&A. If you are new to Wood by Wright, uh, we do a live every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Central Time. And uh, we most of the time we're doing other things such as joints or working with one-on-one uh, -on -one beginners. Uh, but once a week, once a month on the whichever Tuesday falls on 18, uh, we do a Q&A. So um, yeah, you can put your questions in the comments if you're watching us live. If you're watching this recorded, then go down in the description down below and I have a large list of all of the questions that have been asked, or in my case, will have been asked. <laughs> and uh, beside all of those, we have timestamps so you can jump roughly to where they are in the video. Uh, so you can um, go through those rather than reading through all of them. You can just read the ones you want. Uh, so I hope you like that. Um, things coming up. Oh, um, yes, I do have... Um, every two years I release a puzzle, uh, usually October or November, and uh, this, this year's came out a week ago, and I still have about six of them left. When they are gone, they are gone, and you're going to have to wait another two years for them. Um, so if you are wanting that, it's a thousand piece puzzle, and it's a puzzle of the, uh, the shop, um, which is kind of fun. I just finished putting this one together. Why isn't it on? Oh, that's why. <laughs> Helps if I have the camera. And, uh, well there. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun. They, it's been kind of interesting to see how they were over the years and each one uh, the shop changes and this one didn't have that much. This is soon after I built this section and then this one was uh, two years ago and then the one now. So um, yeah these are a lot of fun and it's one of my favorites because you get to know where everything is in the shop and I still pick up a piece and like I don't think I own that. I, I, pretty sure <laughs> and then later on it's like oh yeah it goes there look at that <laughs> pretty sure <laughs> so lots of fun um, oh and I do have to say a huge thank you um, to the chat last week um, <laughs> due to the the chat and one uh, very generous uh, member here on the, the channel um, oh, we have now gotten into uh, making espresso my daughter and me so um, yeah we've got a couple of videos coming up where I'm gonna be making some uh, extras for that so yay um, <laughs> so if James seems right. extra jumpy tonight. Yes. I haven't had any since this morning. But uh, my daughter and I have been having a lot of fun with that, and uh, Sarah's been putting up with the smell in the house. So. <laughs> At least it steams the milk for hot cocoa. Yeah. <laughs> Frothy hot milk over Sarah. <laughs> hot cocoa. Hot moco. <laughs> Moot cocoa. <laughs> So, um, yeah, if you have any questions, throw those in the chat, and we'll get to them. What's the first on the list? Let's see. Dennis Miko asks, how should I store planes in an unseated building for the... Oh, I think he meant unheated. <laughs> building for the winter so they will not rust. Rust. Um, well, if, if you're going to be using them, um, then just bump up your... Um, your uh, um, regular routine of oil. Um, and for me, I don't have that much moisture problem down here, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty blessed in that. But I, I usually go through all of my tools about once every six months and just wipe everything down with a rag that has oil on it. Um, I use uh, just a simple three-in-one, and uh, that's all I need to do here. If you're going to be in a more moist environment, you're going to have to do that more often, or you're going to have to use something stronger. Um, if you are not going to be using them for a while, though, the best thing you can get is get a, a, a um, like an 18 gallon tote or some plastic tub that can seal and wrap them up, oil them, put them away, um, and then put some desiccant in there. And you can buy like a gallon jug of desiccant that will keep the air in there perfectly dry. Um, and that will keep the rust out entirely. Um, if you have a toolbox, you can actually buy these desiccant bars you can put on the side and they keep the air inside the toolbox drier than the air outside the toolbox. Um, those are um, very, very useful. Um, but yes, oil, uh, wrap, and then put some desiccant in there to dry out the air, and it's amazing how uh, uh, they, they'll actually stay. Um, but if you're going to be regularly pulling them in and out, then that doesn't work quite so well. In that case, it's just regular maintenance. And the more, moist, more moisture you have in the air, the more the maintenance. Um, so yeah, good luck. <laughs> what's, what's next? Uh, Kenny and Janet Horn want to know, are there plans to do a video on setting a saw? Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, is it down here? Yes, I do. I've got uh, this thing I purchased a while ago, which is one of my favorites. I want to show a couple different methods. It's a, it's a video I've been wanting to make for a while, uh, but I'm wanting to get a few things um, to show 
that you don't need specialty tools, or yes, you do need specialty tools. Um, I don't know when that's going to be coming out, but it will be coming out soon. Uh, but this one's kind of fun because this one actually screws into the dog holes. Um, so yes, um, I don't know when. If I had to guess, I'd say sometime around December, but uh, it might be earlier. We'll see. <laughs> Let's see. Alex wants to know, please show your Miller Falls number one spoke uh, shave. Just yes. want to confirm it has extra screw holes. I am sorry. Um, I was meaning to, uh, to send you pictures of that. And this is actually a video I want to come up because I've been playing with this. Um, the Miller Falls... Um, oops, come on, focus. This is the Miller Falls number two. It's one of my favorites. It has this mouthpiece you can take out and flip around. So I have a rounded sole on here, and then the other side I can have a flat sole. And I can do it both up one. It's a very dainty, simple tool. Uh, this is the Miller Falls number one, though. Um, and this one, this one I have two holes here and two holes here. So I can actually take this out and clamp it back here. Um, and see, the thing with the Miller Falls number one uh, is that this does not work with a tight mouth. You cannot close this mouth up tight. It's got to be rolled back a ways. Um, and so these screw holes here allow me to clamp it close to this, or I can roll it back farther and put them back in here to clamp farther back. Um, so it gives me two different positions. So I hope that helps you. But yeah, you have to have a very big open mouth on this in order for this to work. Um, so it does not have a, a tight mouth. Kind of an interesting, uh, interesting device. But yeah, I've got a, a few things to point out. Um, Alex did a video on the geometry. And this, the surface by the mouth isn't rounded. It actually goes inset and is flat a little bit here. Um, so kind of a, a different little device. But uh, yeah, this is called the uh, a cigar um, um, boat spoke shave. But uh, stay tuned. But that's a video coming tuned soon. <laughs> What's next? Ken Carlisle wants to know, do you have a source for protective chisel tips slash sleeves? Um, you can buy those on Amazon. Um, the problem is that every <laughs> chisel is going to have a, a different uh, um, um, thickness of steel. Um, usually, I don't like using those because it gives you a false sense of security. Um, if I'm going to be traveling with them or I'm going to be storing them, I put uh, a piece of masking tape on the tip. Um, and that, that works really, really well for um, taking them places. Um, but if they're going to be in the shop, I like to have a place where I store them and the tip is protected. Um, such as on the wall back here, I've got my slots that they all fit into. And I made that, what, five, six years ago now? Um, this is actually once designed so this whole rack can come out. And I had it originally designed to go onto the back of the bench so you could take that whole thing out and mount it other places. Um, worked pretty well, but now that I have the tool wall here, I just like having it right there. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to see why you would want the plastic tip covers. Um, because, yes, they do sell them. Protective. It doesn't say plastic. Well, they're, they're plastic. Oh. Um, they're, yeah, they're just, um, I don't know. I've, I've always found them to be a very false sense of security. I've, I've cut myself more putting them on and taking them off than I ever would just leaving them out and rolling around. So, I don't know, maybe it's just me. I'd love to hear what you guys think about it. Throw some in the chat or send me an email. So back to your Miller Falls number one spoke shave. Uh -huh. So for the extra screw holes, which seem to be unusual, is that mean yours is modified or did it come that way? Um, I believe it came that way, although I'll have to look at it because, I mean, th those do not look modified. They are, they, I mean, I take these ones out, they're the exact same chamfer around the holes as they are in this one. Uh, but this allows me to open it up even farther because these screws here, if I open it up um, uh, for a, a much broader mouth, they don't clamp as well on the mouth, and I need to move them back here to get the, the other clamping spot. Um, so no, I don't think that they are modified. I mean, they look, yeah, I mean, they look part of it. But I haven't done a type study on it, and I don't know if there's any others. So um, if anyone else has a Miller Falls, Miller's Falls number one, uh, let me know. I always find that funny. Miller's Falls. Two S's. <laughs> yeah, the handles come off. They're kind of fun. Becomes a good fidget tool. <laughs> What's next? See, Joe wants to know, when are you going to make the screw box? 
<laughs> Someday. Um, that one's a, I'm going to put it, oh, it's back over there. Um, that is someday. Um, the, there's, there's a couple problems with it. Number one, I made a double thread, which for big ones like this, uh, that means I have to have two cutters. Um, and because I'm making a really deep groove, I probably should do it with four cutters. Uh, one to do an initial pass and one to come through and actually clean it out. Um, but that means I need to source uh, four cutters. Now, I could make them. Uh, Roy Underhill actually has a really cool video of making them um, out of a, um, a uh, old uh, saw sharpening file. Um, and that could be a good video. I just haven't gone out to make it and I haven't been able to find a source for cutters that are that large. Um, Tay Tools sells cutters for smaller teeth that I would do up to about inch. Um, but for a two inch, um, they would be way, way too small. Um, I'd have to put in like four um, threads side by side. And so it's one of those videos where I want to do it, but there's a lot of legwork before I've got to do in order to make it happen. And finding time for that is very difficult right now because I've got a lot of other very pressing projects that I have to get done. Um, and so that just doesn't have much time to fit into that. But I really should because it would be kind of fun. So yeah, if anyone has a really good source for large um, V-tool cutters, um, other than actually like using a V-tool chisel, which actually that might be an interesting idea. I wonder if I could use a cheap folded steel chisel tip and cut it off and redo it. I don't know. I have to think through that one. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> we'll see. Someday that will happen. When? I don't know. What's next? Let's see. Um, Woodworking with Logan asked, would you suggest me getting Lee Nielsen hand saws or Veritas? I'm kind of working on a tool list to get over the next few years. Um, many different characteristics. Uh, Veritas are cheaper. Lee Nielsen are what I would consider middle of the road. They're not the highest end, uh, but they're not the lowest end. Veritas are entry level, probably the cheapest saws you're going to get that will do the work very well. Um, now how well the saw performs, how well the saw makes the cut is not dependent on the maker. Um, a Lee Nielsen saw will cut a line just as well as a Veritas saw, just as well as a Bad Axe saw. They all will cut well if they were sharpened well. And how well the saw cuts is completely dependent on the last person to sharpen it. Um, so if you buy it and use it, eventually you're going to have to sharpen it. And that saw will only be as good as your sharpening skill. Um, so as to how well does it cut, um, it comes down to how well do you sharpen. Um, and that is, is really where that's at. Um, all that being said, the rest of it comes down to the handle. And so here's the one that I just made um, for me. and. Uh, it really needs to be able to fit your hand. You want good, heavy horns on here. They wrap around, they feel good. It gives you more control, more capability. Uh, this is one from Jared Green, absolutely beautiful. He does an amazing job. It's a, a tad bit thinner than I want, but I think for most hands that would be perfect. Um, I like mine to be a bit beefier, but not by too much. Um, incredibly comfortable handle. Um, Veritas are very, very close. Uh, the, the, the downside to them is that they are, they're completely routed. They're not, um, they're not hand filed. So th that's one of the reasons why they can make them so cheap is that the horns don't quite grip your hand quite as much. You can see how the top horn on this one wraps around a little farther. The bottom horn wraps around a little farther and that will actually hold on to your hand. Um, and so the Veritas just aren't quite as, as ornate. Uh, the Lee Nielsen are a step better than this but they're still in that, um, they're, not, they're not amazing. Um, if you want to go that step, then you're probably going up to something like Jarrett Green, um, Floor Up Tools, Bad Axe Tool Works. Um, those are going to be beautiful, beautiful handles. Um, so when you're buying a saw, you're not buying the saw plate. The saw plate, everyone out there has the exact same steel. Everyone out there has a really good sharpening system. Um, you are buying the handle. 
Um, so how ornate and nice is that and how much of a budget do you want to put onto it? Uh, because when you really start getting into nice handles that feel good, that are shaped well, you're paying someone to spend a lot of time with a file to detail it. There is no way that a machine can actually make these compounded file cuts. Um, that's something that's just got to be done by hand. And that's expensive because you're paying someone to actually do the work and the work takes a good bit of time. Um, so should you buy Veritas, Lee Nielsen, depends on your budget. Um, they will cut beautifully. They will both make amazing cuts and you'll be very happy with that. Um, and uh, if you are on a budget conscious, get the Veritas. They are fantastic. At some point, you're going to want up. Do you want up one notch to Lee Nielsen or do you want up even more to something that's a really high quality? Now, I know I turned off a lot of people on there because Lee Nielsen kind of has this mystique to it and they make fantastic stuff, don't get me wrong. But when it comes to saw handles, they're, they're middle of the road. Um, that's one point where they could really bump up the game a bit. But then they would also have to bump up the price because that requires a lot more handwork. So what's next? Let's see, did I make anyone angry with that? Sorry, <laughs> I was listening to her washing machine play its song. Um, Timothy Mallon, James, I've been trying to help Alex a couple of times regarding the cutting edge on the Miller's Fall number one. Can you show the bevel edge? Can you read that again? I couldn't quite hear you. So Timothy's been trying to help Alex regarding the cutting edge on the Miller Falls number one. Can you show the bevel edge? Yeah, let me take it out here. Do, 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 this one. Loosen these screws. So on this one, on the number one, this piece out here is the cutter. And it's a, basically a piece of tube with a bevel on there. Um, I don't know what the bevel angle is on that because I don't know how you would actually measure it because you're measuring to a circular shape. Uh, but there is the, the profile on it. So I guess if I were to set this flat on something, that is, I mean, it looks like 90 degrees there. And so on this one, oh, I never noticed that until I took it off. Now that's probably why there's double screws on there, is that this one has a flat surface, and this side is rounded. So I could, like before, this was put on here, and I'd be cutting on that flat surface. And that would actually make it much easier to cut. Whereas if I turned this around 90 degrees, put the screws on the other one, then I'd have it cutting on the round portion here. That would be something fun to play with. I'm going to have to experiment with that and find out more. So, Yeah, if anyone has uh, particular information, something I'm missing, let me know. But the nice way, the thing about the way it holds on is that these screws then just tighten down in. So you set it about where you want it, give it a little tweak, and you're good. Except for I probably want to move those over to this spot now to catch on that one. So yeah, flat edge, rounded edge. That is interesting. Learn something new. Now, I've been playing with it for a while now, and it's one of those tools where it looks really simple, uh, but the more I play with it, the more I'm like, hmm, I should really do some more looking into that. And it's one of the topics I've been wanting to go into and study. And I would love to find someone who's done a type study on it and actually gone through some of the history. That way I could get some more information like that to pass on, but I haven't done that yet. So if you know of someone, let me know. What's next? Let's see. Kenny and Janet Horn asked, I know the Veritas PM V11 plain iron won the great plain iron test. Would that be your choice for Stanley replacement? Um, yes. Uh, for me, if I buy an iron for myself to replace one, um, I'm going Veritas PM V11. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to replace all my irons because it's so much better. In all honesty, I have one iron in all of these planes that has Veritas PMV11, and that is my Veritas custom plane. This is, in my opinion, the best plane ever made, and therefore it deserves the best iron ever made, um, <laughs> which is this one, and I absolutely love my custom plane. Um, but the, that test really made it look like, ooh, that's so good and so amazing, and it, in all honesty, I had to like zoom in on the chart in order to get that deep of quality. Yeah, there's a lot of really bad junk out there I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. 
but most of them are really good and for the general use you're, you're not going to feel that big a difference unless you have been using them for years and you just kind of uh, have, have built up the, the required skill to actually taste that difference um, and so that's why none of these have replacement irons now they, some of them do have replacement irons like this one is a hawk iron I got a long long time ago because I bought this one without it and this is before the plane test um, this was a Lee Nielsen and why do I have the Lee Nielsen in there? Oh, I had the Lee Nielsen because I bought it for the plane test and uh, I might as well use it. Um, and this one didn't have an iron at the time. Um, this one is a Koontz. What is Koontz? Oh, yeah, that's the one I turned into a scrub iron. That one's a, a scrub. Um, and this one, I don't remember who they made. That was an extra one. That's that was a prototype of someone I remember. But I've got Stanley, 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 Stanley. Um, those are all original. This one's a Stanley too. Um, so yeah, I don't. There, there is not enough of a difference for me to go like, ooh, I'm gonna throw out my Stanley and get this. But if I need to buy an iron, I, I'm gonna spend the extra to get a nice one. And for me right now, I would probably buy a PMV11 um, if I needed the iron. If I already have an iron in there, it, it's not worth the upgrade to me. So, but that's my personal taste. Depends on how much money you have to throw at the problem. What's next? Let's see. Jerome Ulrich asked, what are your thoughts on using contact cement for workbench building? Um, as in putting the leather on? Or are you talking for like laminating the top? Or are you talking about putting legs in? Um, we want a little more clarity on that. Um, for putting leather on, I actually did a test video four years ago where I put contact cement on one side and high glue on the other, and I let them sit for a year or so, um, and I came back and basically found out high glue is the way to go. High glue is phenomenal for adhering leather to surfaces. Um, however, contact cement is a horrible glue for wood to wood. Um, in comparison to all the other glues out there, contact cement fails every time. Um, so for laminating a top, absolutely not. Do not use it. it, it I can guarantee it will fall apart and fail on you at some point in the future. Um, so yeah, um, contact cement is not a wood-to-wood -wood glue. Um, laminating the top. Yeah, don't the, don't do that. Okay. Do not don't do. Nope 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 nope. Um, <laughs> it will fail on you in a year or less. Um, almost 100% guarantee that. Um, yeah, it's, it's not. Um, if you want to see the numbers on it, go look at um, the great glue test. Um, I tested 64 different glues side by side um, in several different configurations. Um, and it has its applications, but it needs a lot of porosity to glue. What? It has its applications. <laughs> Just like you. <laughs> what am I, the Google Play Store? Anyway. <laughs> No, you're higher class than that. You're like Apple. <laughs> you don't like Apple. I don't, but I love you. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, for laminating the top, um, epoxy um, or uh, regular wood glue. Um, uh, I would, if I had to pick a glue for the top, it would be epoxy. It gives you the most uh, set time for getting things in place. Um, and it really has a good bond. It doesn't require oxygen to cure. Um, the problem with using regular wood glue is you have to let it sit for a long time to let oxygen get all the way into the inside and to cure the middle of the wood. Um, and so if you're using regular wood glue, let it sit for a week or so before you really start pounding on it um, and just uh, let, it, let it fully cure up. Uh, but epoxy, however long the cure time is. Um, but don't, don't use contact cement. Don't use contact cement, that will, that will fail. So yeah. <laughs> What's next? For those of you who don't know, when we come to lives, I let my mouth run and I don't know why. I think it's because um, she's over there and I'm over here and there's a camera between the two of us. So I <laughs> There's a great gulf fix between us. But once the live turns off, and I, don't, I, I can't record anything for a few more days to let the black eye heal. So. Yeah, you don't act like you're any different off camera than on camera. <laughs> Please. 
Oh, don't worry. She dishes it back, and she's better at it than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I was kicky all night long. Um, <laughs> Blinks G asked, the saw reminded me. James asked about planes, number five or 62 on a video, and you replied, number five, but which brand? Was looking in the $250 price range and thinking Wood River. Um, yeah, well, okay, um, when it comes to new planes, you generally get what you pay for. I, I would basically say do not pay less than 50 bucks for a number five. Um, it, my, in my opinion, the bottom of the list would be something like a Tay Tools. Um, they're, they're not as much quality control on that, and you're going to run into a few issues, but most of the time you're going to get a really good plane that can last you a while. Um, but that's the bottom of the list, and you can start building up from there. Um, you can get up to things such as like the, the Stanley Sweethearts, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, Bench Dog. Um, those are slightly better in the bottom, but they're not amazing. Um, and then you get up to the ones like the Wood River. Wood River is the bottom of the premium or the top of the affordable. Um, it's kind of like that, that good butter zone there. A Wood River plane generally will last you for the rest of your life and probably through your kids as well. Um, and it's generally really good stock um yeah so that's where, that's where i would go i mean if, if you've got the money the next step up from that in my list would be a lee nielsen and then the next step up from that would be well i don't know lee nielsen and veritas standard planes i put those right about the same they're, they're kind of two different philosophies for the same level of quality um whereas lee nielsen tries to take um the historical bump it up a notch, make it a little bit nicer, and, and, and resell that. Um, Veritas says, um, I like the historical, but I really want to bring in some new technology and re new design and kind of switch things around and make something new and fangled. Um, and so it's two different ways to look at the same thing. But then, in my opinion, the, the top of the standard user is the Veritas Custom. Um, it's just got so many things that go into it. It's, it's, it's a completely redesigned um, thought through a hand plane, at least as far as you can get that way. Um, and really, really good. But then you can take it even farther if you want to and go into things like, um, like Sauer and Steiner, uh, where you're going to be spending thousands of, for a hand plane. Um, and for that, once you go above that, you're, 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 you're not looking at buying usability and extra quality. You're buying a name. You are buying, um, I mean, you're, you're buying quality. You are buying the absolute top-notch quality. Um, you're buying something that's it's not going to do better work than any other plane, but it's really going to make you feel good. I mean, really going to make you feel good. But. <laughs> there are no feelings in woodworking. <laughs> like, there's no crying in baseball. Anyways. Um, That just like convinced every person to buy the more expensive. <laughs> it the makes worst. you feel good. Yeah. Which cheaper therapy, a new saw? I mean, I just justified it for a bunch of people. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> JS Trucking and Guitars asked if making your own saw plate, what thickness of steel would you use? Uh, depends on the type of saw you want. Um, the bigger the saw, the thicker the plate. The smaller the saw, the thinner the plate. Um, so, yeah, I would have to know what type of saw. Um, I gotta actually measure it to remember off the top of my head. I wanna say for a panel saw, I like something around, what, 0.035? Let me find my favorite one here. Um, so for a good panel saw, I like it to be yeah, 0 0.03, 0 0.035, yeah, somewhere in that range. For the handsaw, I want it to be a bit thicker. Um, my handsaw is 0 0.04. Um, I have clarification, it's a rip saw. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about like a large handsaw, um, in which case 0 0.04 is what I like. I might go down to a 0 0.3. Um, and with this, you have to be careful because um, this one, the large handsaw, a lot of these were ground, and so they're thinner at the back. Uh, so in this case, the back is uh, 0.025, 
and at the cutting edge it is four or five. So that's a decent amount of difference. That is two hundredths of an inch difference between the back and the cutting thickness. And they, they do that because um, having it a little bit thinner means that the board isn't going to pinch up on it quite as easily, so you can actually cut a little bit better. Um, but yeah, for big handsaw, I would do uh, 0 0.04, 0 0.035. Um, this one's 0 0.045, but it's also 26 inches long, so that's a pretty long one. But then you get down to the dovetails, and uh, my favorite dovetail is this one, and this one's got to be like what? 0.02? Inches, for those of you who don't know. Um, yeah, 0 0.02. Little one. Cool. What's next? Okay. We have the saying for your um, Valentine's Day shirt next year. Valentine's Day shirt? Yes. Cause they're all, the, the phrase, tools fill the holes in our hearts. <laughs> has become a motto all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be something like on the front is uh, tools create the holes in your heart and on the back it would be something like uh, wood shavings fill them. <laughs> uh, anyways, we digress. Um, what's it reading the show? Sarah with you, James has no holes in his heart. Oh, bonus points, Dr. Khan. Bonus what points. What was that? It says, Sarah with you, James has no holes in his heart. Tis true. She completes me. Like that last piece in the puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like a million piece puzzle. <laughs> That's My life all was one, a one piece puzzle, and then I married Sarah. Now I've got a good ten thousand to work on. <laughs> <laughs> she keeps it fun. <laughs> it's like a puzzle where the, the pieces keep moving, and then occasionally they change colors on you. <laughs> there are no edges. <laughs> it's like a Mobius strip of a puzzle. <laughs> James would be like those easy, like 16 piece puzzles because they the would big tell floor it. Ones. It like comes with instructions. This piece here first. <laughs> the alphabet change. Just A, B, C, D. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, back to questions. Um, what did Lynx ask? On the saw question, if it's the handle that's really important after watching your video making handles, Wonder, is there anywhere to just buy the plates already sharpened and then make the handle? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, um, Blackburn Toolworks um, sells the backs, the screws, the plates are, uh, the plates aren't um, sharpened and set, but all the teeth are cut. Um, so all you have to do is set the teeth and then file them, um, and you're ready to go. Um, uh, also, Floor Up Tools, um, he sells saw parts as well. Um, don't think Jared Green does, but he might. If you contact him, I'm sure he'd be willing to sell them to you. Um, but yeah, you can buy them already done and just work on the handle. Um, and Blackburn Toolworks, he has an amazing, um, he has a, a collection of um, scans of handles and then actually has the PDF printout so you can slap them on the wood and cut out exactly the shape. And then they all come in three different sizes so you can measure your hand and find the handle that fits your hand. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a, an amazing resource. Um, but yeah, making, making a handle that fits the pattern and then you're shaping it down and fitting it to your hand and you're holding the saw and you're filing off here and you hold the saw and you file off here and it's just making it fit your hand is one of these treats that is just, oh, it's, it's, it's awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> What's next? Let's see. Jose Morel asked, <clears throat> during the last MW MWTCA meet you conducted, you piqued my interest in the Stanley 55 plane. Based on costs I'm seeing, I'm considering pur purchasing a new one from Lee Valley. What are your thoughts? Thanks. Um, yeah, 
um, the the one from Veritas is is phenomenal. It works really really well, um, and it is it's the only combination plane that's out there that's that's that I know of that's worth anything. <laughs> um, that's new. That's worth anything, and it's it does great work. Um, so yeah, if you can afford it, you want to swing it, go for it, um, because the the antique ones. If if I had a Veritas and an antique 55, and I needed to do something that the 55 would do, or the, the, the Veritas combination, um, I would probably pick the 55. Um, I just, I, I find it to be a little bit more, what's the word I'm looking for? Fun. I don't know. It, 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 it's a little bit more of a, an enjoyable experience. Um, though the one from Veritas is easier to set up, um, and it's much smoother in its action. Um, so if you're going to pick one that's for fun pure functionality, get the one from Veritas. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to think. I, I don't think I've ever done a project where I've needed the items that the 55 has. Um, I, the only time I've, I've done those things is for demonstration sake. Um, so unless you do a lot of weird moldings, there's really no reason to get the, the 55 over the 45. Um, but yeah, it's a side question. So, what's next? Ah, uh, let's see. <laughs> Alex wants to know for April 1st, are you planning to make a hand-powered biscuit jointer? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no. I hate biscuits. They're <laughs> stupid things. Um, biscuits are useful if you do a lot with thickness planers and you don't want to do much after the case. Biscuits are there for alignment. They add nothing to the joint strength and they actually weaken the joint strength. Um, so the, if, 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 you're, if you have a thickness planer and you want to put two boards together and when they're done they're too thick to go through the thickness planer, biscuits are the way because they help you with that alignment and they get everything right in place. Um, I mean, not perfectly, but really close to it. Uh, so, yeah. No, I don't have plans to make a hand-powered biscuit joiner. One of these days, I would actually like to make a hand-powered domino. That would be fun. Or to buy a domino that doesn't work and uh, take the motor off and, and put a crank on it. I think that would be absolutely hilarious. Okay, remind me, what's a domino? Uh, a domino is a floating tenon machine. Um, so you got a mortise and tenon. Yeah. Um, a floating tenon is where you have the tenon by itself, and it's tenon this way and tenon this way, and so you create a mortise into this board and a mortise into this board, and you put a, it's basically a tenon both ways. I need pictures, but okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a it looks like a domino, like like a domino. Gotcha. And it half goes into this board and half goes into this board. Uh, the domino, the machine, cuts the slot here and cuts the slot here so the two can fit in. Okay. If that makes any sense. No, not really. <laughs> Uh, Glenn Dornack asked, a friend of mine quit woodworking and gave me his number four and number six Stanley planes that are pla painted black. Around what year were they made? I don't know. Um, the black Japaning um, is the original color and they did that up until, what, the 80s? I think it was when they stopped doing that. Because then they started, uh, in like the, the 60s, I want to say, they, they ran a series with maroon. The handyman then were blue. Um, yeah, I don't know when they actually stopped doing black Japaning. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, but if you want to look up the age of it, go to the website called HyperKitten. HyperKitten.com. Crazy name, wonderful website. Um, he actually has a full flow chart that you can go through and ask the question of, um, how many patent dates are stamped at this particular location in the plane? Okay, that narrows it down to these dates, and then it'll ask what questions this have, and then it narrows it down to these plates, and it goes to this whole flow chart until you come down to, this is a type 11 between this date and this date. Um, and that's the, the easiest way to type age um, the plane. But, uh, yeah, good luck. <laughs> What's next? Um... Robert Lunsford asked, what is a ballpark price for a Stanley Chamfer plane? 
I found one in good shape for 250 and was wondering if I should get it. Uh, depends completely on where you're at, um, what it comes with. Um, if it's just the original with one of the front ends. And one of the things I really wish I had said in the video is that um, there, there were other front ends you could put on. The one I had was the bullnose. Um, and for a long time, that's the one they sold. Um, that was what came with it. Um, then later on, they also offered a longer nose. Um, and then they sold them with both the longer and the bull nose with the kit. And then there was also the... Um, whatever its number is, and a half, which is a whole other nose that you could put scratch stocks on. Um, and that one, um, yeah, and so there's other things like that. And so if you have all three of them around here, 200, 250, that'd be about a decent price. If you have just one of the heads um, and the, 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 the handle stock, um, around here you're looking at like 70 bucks, 80 maybe. Um, so that, that wouldn't be worth it. But if you're out in like California, maybe. Um, I would be expecting something around 150 out in California would be my guess. Um, so it sounds like it is too expensive, but I don't know what all it comes with. Um, so yeah, let me know. <laughs> that sounds like an eBay price where someone saw that someone else had posted it for that price on eBay. So they decided to put it for that price on eBay. And send uh, James a message with pictures and yep. he'll tell Send me you. pictures and I'll take a look and let you know. What's next? Uh, Kester Smith asks, so let's get to basic. I'm very new to this and I have a couple of pieces of firewood that is curly oak. What is the best tool to get one flat edge so I can run it through a table saw to get some blocks? Um, well, the, to get a flat edge is a saw. Um, you can get a saw cut flat enough that you can put it against the fence and run it through. Um, and then you can flip it over and clean up those marks on the saw again. Um, um, the problem with curly wood is you can't plane it with a standard plane. Um, you've got to have a smoothing plane. It's got to be set up with an inch of its life. It's got to be a really clean, sharp edge, tight mouth. Um, all the little bells and whistles have to be in perfect alignment. Um, and so, yeah, setting up a smoothing plane is, is the way you would then take it from saw marks on down. And you're going to spend more time because you're taking off thin, thin shavings. Um, so just understand that's that. Um, you can't take off heavy shavings. You can't use a normally set plane. You cannot use a low angle plane. Even with a high angle blade on there, it's going to cause you nightmares. Um, yeah, it's all about the setup on the plane. Um, especially with oak. Um, curly oak is... I have to use the right words. It is not the hardest wood, but it is the hardest wood in the world to plane. It is the most difficult. It is, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's incredibly difficult to do right. Um, so, random orbital sanders were designed because of curly oak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, a saw would be what I would use to get the flat face. Um, and then if I need it smoother or I need to refine it, then I'd break out a, a, a smoothing plane. And if you want to know how to set that up, um, I have probably six or seven different videos on how to set up a smoothing plane. Um, so Google that and you'll come across one of them and uh, it'll take you through that. What's next? Let's see. <clears throat> Jerome Ulrich asked, flesh or hair side of leather for a strop? Personal preference. Um, for me, um, I use the, the, the rough side. Um, it holds the, the, the compound a little bit better. Um, and so sometimes I'll actually have the rough side with the compound on it, and then I'll flip it over to take the burr off. Um, and I'll use the smooth side without anything on it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just personal preference. Some people prefer to use the smooth side. Some people prefer to use the wet, rough side. Honestly, put a little on both sides and see which one you like. Um, I find that the, the smooth side um, doesn't hold on to the compound quite as well, and it tends to make a bit more of a mess, but uh, yeah, six of one half dozen of another. So have some fun. <laughs> Excuse me. Make a weird hiccup noise. David, R David. David Ramos asked, anyone know if, there, if I could do a frame saw with a broke band saw blade? Yes, very much so. Um, actually... I don't have that one here anymore. 
Um, I made a turning saw a while ago um, with, a, with a bandsaw blade. Um, it was a quarter inch bandsaw blade. Um, just drilled some holes through it and attached it either end. There you go. Um, if you want something bigger, bigger works well. Uh, the problem with using a bandsaw blade is if you're going to get one that's bigger than like three quarter inch, you want something that's like an inch or two inch, you're going to be getting really big monstrous teeth on there. And if you're hand powering something, you generally don't want teeth that are any bigger than like two PPI at absolute max. Uh, personally, I don't like one hand, one person pushing anything bigger than like a, a three or four PPI. Um, you're getting massive teeth that just dig in and they require a lot of force. Um, on big pit saws, you might get large ones that have like uh, um, maybe as big as one PPI, but you have two people and you have gravity working with you. Um, and so that's, that's a whole different deal. Um, so it can be hard to find a broken bandsaw that has the right teeth, but not unheard of. They are out there. So, yes, it works very well. What's next? One second. Kenny and Janet Horn wants to know, do you have an update on how Eric Florup is doing? I do not. Um, I've been wanting to go and look him up and ask him, um, but I haven't. Um, so I should do that here soon. Um, last, the last I heard is that they were, um, they have a plan of treatment um, and they're marching down it, but it's going to be one of those things of, this is going to take a few months, um, so we'll see. What? I was trying to remember what came up for him. I mean. What his issue, I'm assuming it's medical. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I got to look that up and answer it. Kenny wants to know, do you have a pair of level sights? I do not. Um, I have winding sticks. And for most things in woodworking, that's really all you need. And uh, larger winding sticks for bigger boards, smaller winding sticks for smaller boards. And uh, they're a lot of fun to use. No, they're not. <laughs> no, they're not. They're, they, they are very simple devices, um, but they, yeah. Um, there was one of those things where I have to, with Sarah, I had to explain it like six different ways and then finally it clicked and she's like, oh yeah, I get it now. It's like, okay, good. Um, most people, it's, it, I usually have to explain it two or three different ways um, until finally it, it clicks because it, 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 it's a very, very simple system, but it, it is slightly counterintuitive and... Uh, I think it's simple for someone who can visualize it, visualize things easily. Mm. I but do have far more spatial. Not a visualize. Honestly, mental. It also clicked a little bit more when I watched uh, what's his face, your twin, Rex. Rex did. A, I, for some reason, was watching a video. I don't usually watch other <laughs> channel videos, um, and it kind of made sense too. Sometimes you just need to hear a different person's take. Very but true. Anyway. That's why when, when someone's like, well, why did you make a video on that? Because so-and-so made a video. It's like well, different people have different ways of saying it. And uh, sometimes you just need to hear it a different direction. So, yeah, there's lots of different ways out there. What's next? Let's see. Greg Stemmen. There's lots of doubles in their name, Greg. I like it. Um, I saw your video on using and sharpening a number 80 cabinet scraper. I bought one and I can't get it to keep scraping. What causes it to stop scraping nicely so quickly? Used knife steel to burnish it. Um, um, it could be that the screw that pushes it forward is backing out and the plate is coming back in. Um, it could be that the plate isn't in there tight enough and is actually sliding up. Um, uh, it could be that you're putting too fine a burr on there and you're really trying to aggressively cut with it and you're actually just ripping the burr off of the, the, the card scraper. Um, i trying to think of what other options it would be. Yeah, I don't know. Be fun to play with though. So yeah, I would uh, would love to hear what you're having issues with. So send me some pictures or ways. I would love to, uh, love to help you out on that. I think through what it could possibly be. Because, um, I mean, usually I've got a good three, four minutes or so of just constant scraping. 
um, until I want to take it out, flip it over, and use the other side. And I get another three or four minutes, and I stop and sharpen them. Um, but three or four minutes is usually all I need for an average project to cover the main surfaces I want for the cabinet scraper. So, yeah, I'd love to hear your what you're running into. Be interesting. What's next? Let's see. Matt wants to know, looking to get a very large walnut slab from, is it Gobi Walnut? Gobi Walnut? And work it entirely by hand tools. You are the only one I've seen try to do something similar. Besides keeping the blade sharp, any tips? Um, patience. Uh, crazy, 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 crazy amounts of patience. Um, understand that every step in the process is going to take you three, four, five times as long as you think it will. And when you're actually there doing the work, time slows down and it takes three or four or five times faster than even, longer than even that because you're, you're making shavings. Um, plan breaks into your work. Don't say, okay, I'm going to go out here, I'm going to plane this whole surface down. No, say, like, I'm going to plane this area of the surface and then I'm going to take a break for three or four minutes and I'm going to plane this area of the surface. Um, I love YouTube for that. And I'll actually break it up and say, okay, I'm going to do this much, and then I'm going to watch one video. And then I'm going to do this much, and then I'm going to watch one video. Um, and then I go back and forth, and I find that that actually works really, really well. Um, and, and especially if you haven't developed the muscle memory and muscle mass to, um, to keep doing it for a long time, that's, that's a, uh, the, the endurance required for that is significant. Um, but yeah. Um, it can be done. It's just slow. <laughs> very, very slow. Very, very tedious, um, but very rewarding, too. A lot like my wife. Incredibly rewarding. Worth oh. every minute of it. I thought you said I was affordable. I was like, meh. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say. I she ain't me. a high-maintenance girl. No. <laughs> You throw a crab ragoon from a safe distance, you're good. <laughs> Take me on vacations and we're okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Anton HS. I recently learned about number nine piano makers block plane. Lee Nielsen or Stanley. Is it really as good as it is described? Um, it's a block plane. Um <laughs> It's going to do the exact same thing any other block plane can do. Um, as to, um, you know, um, setup and capability, eh, yeah, it's a little nicer. Um, there's a few tweaks you can do to make it even better. Um, but it's a block plane. <laughs> no, I, in my money, no. I, I, would, I, I, I would personally never spend the money to buy a new block plane. You can pick up an antique one that will work you just as fine for five, ten bucks. Um, yeah, it may not tweak quite as well, um, but it will do just the exact same for the woodworking. Um, so yeah, this is my nine and a half that I've had for seven years now, and uh, I love it. Just a simple block plane. <laughs> Block planes are one of those things where, yeah, you, there's. If, if you're spending money on it, you're spending it for the joy of spending money. Um, unless you really want that high end tweakability. Um, and then you're going to be buying, like, the Lee Nielsen, you're going to be adding the. You can get a little bearing thing that goes in there so that you're not moving the, the blade laterally as you adjust it in and out. And there's a few other little functioning things you can upgrade it even further. But yeah, then you're just running down the hobby habit hole. <laughs> What's next? Let's see. Ken Carlisle asks, can you show the method you would use to sharpen a heavily cambered iron like a scrub plane? Um, sure. Let me... So, um, when, 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 when speaking, um, oh. That's not my scrub plane iron. Well, let me grab this scrub plane iron. I just sharpened this one not too long ago, so I won't need it, but I'll show it on the fine one. Give it a nice little touch up. Um, so I've got my diamond plates here. 
And there's a couple different ways to do it. My favorite is I'm going to spread this around. I'm going to start it up on the corner, lock my, my wrists in, and as I bring it back, I'm going to rotate it to the other side. And I'm going to keep going back and forth this way. And then I'll start up over here, and I'll go the other direction, and I'll end up with like this scratch pattern on the stone that's an X. And so I'm rocking it as so my wrists are twisting as I go from one side to the other. So as I drag it back, I'm just rolling like that. That's my preferred method. Um, the other one that a lot of people like, oops, let me go back to this. The other one a lot of people like is starting back here and putting it 90 degrees to the plate and then rocking it forward this way. The nice thing about doing it this way is you can use the full width of the plate. And again, you're using that same twisting motion with the wrist but you're just moving in and out. Um, and so those are the two methods that I, I generally tell people to use more than any other. Making sure I actually sharpened it. Oh, good, I was riding back up too far. This one is a pretty steep bevel. And I had it down lower, so I was just rubbing on the back of the bevel, so I didn't hurt it at all. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I don't know if I have a video on that. How to sharpen the scrub plane iron. I should do a video on that. <laughs> you should do it live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's one of those things where it, 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 to do it freehand takes a certain amount of skill. Um, you've really got to be patient and realize the first time you do it, you're not going to do an amazing job. Um, second time you do it, you're not going to do an amazing job. Third time you do it, it'll be passable. Um, you know, it's going to take a few times, and uh, eventually you'll get it. But the only way you can learn the skill is to do it. And the only way you're going to do it at the beginning is to completely mess up. In which case, that's okay. But perfectly fine. That is part of the system. In order to learn a new skill, you've got to mess up. It's just the way it goes. A um, few things you could do is just understand it, think about it, practice it, and eventually you'll get there. Let's that see. is why you start one, two more. with cheap planes. <laughs> uh, how about one more? Okay, what do we got? Chris Davis asked, is the Veritas shooting plane worth the cost over a standard bench plane? Um, <laughs> I, I generally do not advocate for buying specialty planes. Um, you're buying a one-trick pony that you're going to use far less, and generally, it's just not worth the money. You know, if you have a low-angle jack plane, it's going to do really well. Um, it's going to be very pleasing. But the first time you use a dedicated shooting plane, you will hate with a passion using anything other than a dedicated shooting plane. So understand that that will do it perfectly fine. And a step down from that, any one of these planes will do it perfectly fine. But they're going to take a little bit more patience. They're not going to give you quite the same result. It's going to be a little bit more finagly. Um, but the moment you try one of these, you're never going back. Um, so is it worth the money? If you're having lots of plane problems with the standard plane, yes. It is worth the money because these just, they work. It is amazing and fun and suddenly shooting makes sense. And um, it's one of those things where I, I, I've made, what, five or six different shooting boards over the years. And I, when I first got started, I was just using the number five. Works great, works well. And then I got a low angle plane and I thought, oh, this is great. I'm, this, is, this is what shooting's all about. Um, but through that time, I never really did much shooting. I preferred to freehand shoot rather than using a shooting board. And then I got a shooting board plane. And now, if I need to shoot something, I put it on the shooting board. Which is kind of weird, because I never did that before. And this has made shooting very enjoyable. Um, so, is it yes, necessary? No. Uh, but it's one of those specialty tools where once you get it, you wonder, why did it take me so long to get it? Now, don't buy an antique. Go buy the one from Veritas. It is better than the antique. It's probably cheaper than the antique. Um, and so that, yeah, it's a good good money. And every now and then, if you catch it right, Veritas has um, seconds sales. And they almost always have shooting board planes at seconds. But you have to jump on them because everyone else wants them. 
Um, and they're really good deals. And it's one of the few times where you can actually get a left-handed shooting board plane. So if you're a lefty, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that will do it. So, so, so missing anything else? If we didn't get to your question, send James a message. I promise he'll answer it. Sounds good. Um, that, 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 that. Cool. I think I'll do it for now. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye.